My name is Jan Harzan. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings. MUFON is really more just left of center, where we try to take a scientific approach by collecting the data first off, and then reviewing the data, investigating the data, and making sure that what we're seeing is actually something that's truly an unknown. We have 3,000 members worldwide. Many scientists, physicists, PhDs, metallurgists, biologists, all the way down to just the average citizen who really wants to get involved. Some of those have chosen to become field investigators, and they go through our field investigative training courses. They become part of the team in their state or country where they reside, and they actually get engaged in going out and meeting this phenomena head on. We receive about 500 to 1,000 reports per month from around the world. Field investigators will take the case, generally review it, uh, try to come up with a hypothesis, checking star charts, and we'll go put an investigation in place to determine what exactly happened. We've recently formed a science review board, and that board is made up of scientists from around the United States and around the world to review some of our more significant cases and try to render an opinion on them. What we'd like to do is be more outbound, more outspoken in terms of the really true UFO cases. So MUFON is moving forward with this approach and we'll be publishing papers in these different areas to allow the general public and even the scientific community to be able to be challenged by what we're finding. That's the strength of MUFON as an organization is being really the truth seekers of the UFO field. Good morning, everybody. Our next speaker, Preston Dennett, began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic, unexplained encounters. Since then, he's interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He's a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, a ghost hunter, paranormal researcher, author of 16 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, including Fate Magazine, Atlantis Rising, the MUFON UFO Journal, Nexus, Paranormal Magazine, UFO Magazine, Mysteries Magazine, and Ufologist, just to name a few. Here to talk about if there is an undersea UFO base off the coast of California, let me welcome Preston Dennett. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming here. I want to thank MUFON and Jen Harzan and all the volunteers who make this event happen. I'm really excited about uh, speaking to you today, and I've got a lot of information I want to share. Now, is there an underwater UFO base off the coast of California? I think I've got an, enough evidence to say that there is definitely something going on. Um, and uh, after I'm through with my lecture, you can decide whether or not you know, I've persuaded you. But uh, I'm astounded at what I found uh, after you know, focusing on this particular area. As you all know, I'm sure uh, most of our planet is covered with water. And it's surprising that uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of attention paid to USOs. By that I mean unidentified submersible objects, which are in effect the same thing as UFOs, only that these objects are going in and out of the water, uh, moving at high speeds underwater, uh, much higher speeds than anything that we officially have. And uh, so I think it's no surprise, really, that uh, these objects are uh, using our oceans, our rivers, our lakes uh, to hide or to do whatever it is they're doing. 
Now I want to talk about a few cases outside of uh, California because certainly I've gotten a lot of information all over the world from people who've seen this stuff. Uh, this is a case which took place in New York. A landscape photographer was uh, working there along the East River when he saw the water starting to froth and boil and he snapped a series of four pictures. This is probably the best one. This is from Wendell Stevens' uh, UFO photo archives. And uh, he, yeah, he snapped this picture and watched this object, along with several other witnesses, come right up out of the river. Uh, as for those of you who heard Linda Zimmerman's talk, a lot of uh, UFO activity in upstate New York, where these objects are coming out of small bodies of water, reservoirs, uh, lakes, and things like this. Um, here's a book from Wendell Stevens, uh, UFO Contact from Undersea, which presents a case in which a man and his wife were actually taken to an undersea base off the coast of Florida. And here in this photo, uh, these gentlemen did not see the UFO coming out of the water, but uh, the photo clearly shows something. Um, and not only that, it shows, you can see the water is uh, disturbed underneath this apparent object. Here's another uh, series of photos. These are two different cases, actually, but they are both in the same general area near Tenerife and the Canary Islands. Um, one took place in 1979 and the other in 1974. And it's remarkable because these photos are extremely similar. Uh, Betty Andreessen is an abductee from uh, Massachusetts, and she also reports being taken into an under ground or undersea type base uh, by her uh, ETs and uh, shown all kinds of things. Her case is, of course, extremely complex. But my point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of these undersea UFO cases. Uh, this is a case here which took place in the South Pacific. Uh, there was a huge storm that caused one of the largest sea rescues up to that time. Um, I wrote an article all about this uh, UFO rescue at sea because uh, there was this boat called the Ramtha which was sinking and the rescuers could not find them. And right when this boat was about to sink, this very large glowing object appeared right above the boat and kind of targeted it. This allowed the rescuers to come right up to the boat and pull the passengers off. The object disappeared and no sooner had they pulled these people off when this boat sank. So I thought that was kind of an interesting interactive case. Uh, this was a photo sent to me from a gentleman who was taking photographs of a sunset over New Jersey. And I don't know if you can see it, but if you look carefully, there is a uh, disc right here. And it's a little hard to see. But I'm not sure if this is a trick of the photo aperture. And what's odd is it didn't appear on any of the photos taken before or after. And if you look really closely, it's almost a perfect circle. So I don't know, I thought it was a pretty interesting photograph and certainly really beautiful, but a little hard to see. Now I started to receive, as I said earlier, a lot of cases of these objects over the water. And uh, I didn't think much of it at first, I just cataloged them. This was a case which took place in Mission Bay to two gentlemen who saw this very small object maybe the size of a baseball or a basketball, glowing sphere darting back and forth um, out to sea, back into Mission Bay and all over the place, but just right above the water there. Um, got a number of cases um, involving people who were on Navy ships. Uh, one gentleman told me that he was out in the uh, Atlantic and uh, he was on his ship when everyone was drawn onto the deck to watch these very, really large, bright orange lights, which were pulsing. And uh, he actually went up to the bridge and asked about them, and they said, you're not seeing this, don't talk about it. And uh, he and several other soldiers actually all watched this. The next day, he went up and uh, was telling his buddies who had watched this with him, and uh, none of them remembered it. They had missing time with this sighting. Um, only a few of these, his fellow soldiers or Navy men actually remembered seeing these lights. It's a very interesting case and uh, one of many that I, that I have of people who've you know, been on Navy ships and had encounters. 
Uh, one gentleman who contacted me, his name is uh, Kim Kamen, and he was on a Navy ship in which he was actually taken, abducted from the Navy ship into a UFO. It's a very long, complex encounter. He was fully conscious during the entire thing. He remembered it without hypnosis. He saw these praying mantis type ETs, which were, he said, 10 to 15 feet tall. And uh, it's an extraordinary case, and it's much too lengthy to go into detail here. But uh, my point is that, uh, again, a lot of people are seeing this stuff all across the world. Uh, one gentleman contacted me. He was in a boat about 50 miles off Daytona, Florida. And had, he actually, he's an avid sailor. He'd sailed across the world many times. He's seen submarines surface right near his boat. And he was out there um, off the coast of Florida when he saw these green, bright lights underwater. And he became alarmed, so he stopped his boat. And these lights, this light, came right under his boat and stopped. And he's estimating it was about 50, 100 feet down, um, bigger than his boat, which is you know, a pretty small boat, but at least a couple of hundred feet across, and just stayed there. Uh, he had no real fear. His electronics are, were not affected or anything like that. And eventually, this thing just moved al along. But it was very interesting because he felt like he was targeted. All right, now I first um, began investigating a wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon uh, in 1992. There was a wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon, and uh, this is what kind of led me down this pathway to finding out that there's an undersea base off the California coast. In this case, two boys saw these spiraling star-like objects uh, overhead, which moved back and forth and then disappeared off into the distance. Here's another case in Topanga Canyon in which four uh, young men saw first one object come over the house, followed by two others, followed by this very large object, which sent down a beam of light over the house and uh, really frightened one of the witnesses so badly, he told me, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you any details. I was just too scared. I couldn't look at it. Um, whereas some of the other witnesses were very excited about what they saw and gave a very detailed uh, interview. Uh, here's another case from Topanga Canyon. These people were on Mulholland Drive watching these triangular objects just sitting there in the sky when suddenly they darted towards them and then moved away very quickly. They became very frightened, and I do believe they had missing time, uh, one of many cases uh, in this area involving missing time. So at this point, I'm thinking, wow, you know, this area is definitely a hot spot. Here's another case. These two people were house-sitting in Topanga Canyon, and uh, each time they'd drive through the canyon, they'd see these awfully bright lights, so bright that they felt like it was piercing through their bodies. And it was very low in the canyon, and sometimes they'd see a shape behind it, sometimes not. Um, now, around this time is on June 14th, actually, in 1992. The uh, police station at uh, Lost Hills began receiving calls from people reporting UFOs in Topanga Canyon. At the same time, the local newspaper, The Messenger, also started receiving calls. And this was all on June 14th. And uh, the editor of the newspaper called me up because I'd written the earlier article for the newspaper and asked me to investigate this incident. And so I did. And knowing a lot of people in Topanga Canyon, I was able to locate a number of witnesses to that night who saw incredible UFO activity. And as the years have passed, I've located probably 30 or 40 independent witnesses in different areas of Topanga Canyon and the surrounding areas, such as Santa Monica and Malibu, and even Woodland Hills, uh, who saw activity that night. Uh, in this case, this drawing, again, is uh, by my sister-in-law, Kisara. Most of the artwork you'll be seeing in my lecture tonight are from her. And uh, these, this couple was driving through the canyon when they saw these objects very low, um, really actually below the canyon walls. And the husband turned to the wife and joked, says, look, there's flying saucers. And his wife looked and she, she gasped. She's like, oh my god, they really are. He was just joking. And <laughs> turns and looks and sees that these objects have little lights all around them. They're totally silent, only a few hundred yards away, perfectly saucer-shaped, and are just traveling 
up through the canyon way lower than any plane possibly could. Uh, four people called the police that night. Uh, one couple said that they were chased uh, down through the canyon. They got out of their car and saw two or three saucer-shaped objects which were hovering there and then quickly darted away. Another person said he was driving south through the canyon and he was followed by these objects, again chasing his car, um, all the way down to the ocean. Another person, a professor at Santa Monica College, who had just recently moved into the canyon, he moved out after this, um, woke up because his entire interior of his house was lit up. He and his wife ran outside and there was a giant sphere of light hovering maybe 50 feet above their house. You could hear a low buzzing noise and uh, became very alarmed, called the police station, um, and reported their sighting. And this illustration here comes from another couple who had been eating down at a fish restaurant down on the coast, along with, it turns out, another couple who called the police were at the same restaurant and had apparently left around the same time to drive up through the canyon. And so these, this couple was driving north through the canyon and they became very nervous because they saw this object following them. And the next thing they know, it's right over their car. It's, it sends down a beam of light. It's lifting them up off the road. They had a period of missing time and uh, got home much later that night, called the police in tears, um, just about panicking, um, saying, you know, has anyone reported UFOs? What's going on? We, we're chased by this object. It lifted us up off the car. I've never been so scared in my entire life. And uh, the police said, no, nobody called us, um, which was a lie. I don't know why they did that, but uh, all the witnesses asked the same question, and each time the police said, no, nobody called us. I later found out that the police were collecting about two to 300 reports per year, uh, which I thought, no, that's way too much. I heard this from an eyewitness who was at a dinner party. And later, I talked to another person, and she was describing her encounter, and she says, you know, I was at this dinner party where there was a guy in the police station, and they said they collect two, 300 uh, calls per year. And so I got independent verification of it. So I, this is when I'm starting to realize this place is a real big hot spot. Um, a number of photographs have been taken. This is by Steve Thompson, and uh, he photographed this UFO over Topanga State Park, which is probably where a lot of this activity um, is, is most active. I've got a lot of cases of UFOs landing here, a number of abduction cases, lots of anomalous lights and things like this. I've collected probably two, three hundred uh, sightings over this particular area. And some of these were down by the coast. Um, this is a sighting which took place on Venice Beach. Uh, the witness is actually a set dresser for Star Trek. And he was driving along the freeway, heading towards Venice, very early, early in the morning when he saw this lighted object moving back and forth over the water. And he thought, oh, that's a helicopter. But it looked strange. And it started moving much faster than any helicopter would. And so he pulled off onto the beach, went through the Santa Monica Tunnel there, and pulled off on Venice Beach to examine this thing. And it came darting maybe 20 miles in one swoop and hovered right over the beach there sent down this beautiful beam of light, he said, that had pastel colors in it, scared away a flock of seagulls, and he just watched this thing. He said it was like chrome, mirror surface, just absolutely shiny metal and really beautiful. Here's another case I got from a, a pilot and flight instructor um, who was flying over Santa Monica Bay when he saw this very large, glowing, red cigar-shaped craft, and he and his student are trying to identify this thing when they realize, you know, this is not a plane or anything that they're familiar with. And they're debating with each other whether they should call the Santa Monica airport and report this when finally it disappeared. And he was relieved because he did not want to report the UFO. Um, a couple of weeks later, his student came back and said, you'll never guess what happened. I was driving through Topanga Canyon when this glowing red object came swooping down and chased our car through the canyon. I've got about 10 cases of car UFO chases um, through the canyon. I'm not sure 
what these guys are doing, these ETs, or why they're chasing cars pell-mell down the road, but a, certainly a common type of UFO behavior we've seen in other areas. I um, started receiving more reports um, from the coast, uh, Playa del Rey, Marina del Rey, Santa Monica, a bunch of people were seeing these red glowing objects. Um, so I'm like, wow, you know, this is a new twist. We're seeing this stuff um, over the water here. And I started getting a lot of reports like this. So this is when I started collecting them. I had put a chapter in my book about underwater sightings, and I, that was picked up by a producer for deep sea UFOs. And they put me on their uh, television show to talk about some of these sightings. And that brought more information. I wrote an article for Fate magazine outlining some of these cases, which also brought a new flood of cases. And since then, it hasn't stopped. I've gotten so much information that it's really mind-blowing. And uh, I think I can present a pretty good argument that there is some sort of base off the coast here. Now, before I get into the actual underwater cases, let me tell you a little bit about some of the cases over the water, because there's just so many. And they stretch way back. Um, back in 1953, an engineer by the name of Frederick Hare and several others were on uh, Santa Monica Beach when they saw literally a squadron of saucers, not one or two, but we're talking 20, 30, 40 of these objects performing maneuvers right over the daylight sky. Um, this is not a nighttime sighting. And this went on for quite a while, and later that day the objects returned and performed more maneuvers for a period of about 10 minutes. A couple of years later, a group of fishermen, this was on uh, July 10, 1955, uh, were off the coast of Newport Beach when they observed a blue-silver cigar-shaped object um, moving overhead at just a kind of a moderate uh, speed, not very fast. And uh, two and a half hours later, another family, the Washington family, were sailing about 13 miles off Newport Beach on their way to Catalina Island. Now Catalina kept turning up over and over again, and I soon began to realize this is where it was all centered. Uh, they were on their way to Catalina Island when they saw a perfectly round, gray-white object about 2,500 feet above their boat, and it maintained a solid position right over the boat. They became alarmed and called the Coast Guard, who sent out a plane, and when the plane arrived, the object quickly darted away. So a lot of cases like that. Um, here's a very interesting case of a, a landing right on the beach here. It's a, actually a really well-known classic case in the UFO literature in which a group of cars were driving along the Pacific Coast Highway in Playa del Rey when all three cars stalled at once. And the three gentlemen got out and were trying to figure out why their cars had stalled when this egg-shaped object lands right on the beach there at Playa del Rey, a group of figures exit the object, and they're dressed strangely. They look humanoid, otherwise normal, but are trying to ask these guys questions and speaking in a foreign language that none of them can understand. Uh, after a few minutes, they get back in the object, which takes off, and uh, the gentlemen return to their cars, which are now functioning normally and uh, they report their sighting. Little do they know, at that time, there was a wave of sightings going on up and down the coast. Uh, about 10 hours later, a commanding officer and 12 airmen from an Air Force attachment in Long Beach watched six saucer-shaped objects darting across the sky, and two hours after that, officers at Los Alamitos Naval Station saw numerous objects, and at the same time, Police stations uh, throughout Long Beach received more than 100 calls from Long Beach residents reporting objects. So I think that gives some uh, corroboration and credibility to the gentleman who saw this object actually land and saw figures come out of it. A lot of other sightings. In uh, 1960, Chad Everett was in Beverly Hills on the roof of uh, his home watching the ocean when he and several other people watched this object darting back and forth over the Santa Monica Bay, much too fast to be a helicopter. Uh, Bill Hamilton, who's been a researcher in this area for many years prior to me, um, 
uncovered a case involving a gentleman who was sailing from Catalina to San Pedro when he observed a metallic saucer with four hemispherical pods beneath it. Um, in 1988, Kim Carlsberg, who has now written a book about her encounters, she had a home on Malibu Beach, and she saw this fairly tiny star-like object suddenly it comes zooming in, and it's right in front of her, right just a few, you know, 100 yards away. Very, very bright light, about 50 feet in diameter, and hung about 100 feet outside of her window for more than a minute before it darted away diagonally up into the sky. Um, another interesting case involved two surfers who were surfing one early one morning in Malibu in 1990. Um, it was a very foggy morning, and they were just sitting there on their surfboards right next to each other waiting for the next set of waves when in comes two saucer-shaped objects right out of the fog bank. They hover around there for a few minutes, dart back into the fog bank. They looked at each other and were like, wow, normally don't see that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, a lot of cases. Um, 1993, witnesses on Laguna Beach observed an oval metallic object about 15 to 20 degrees above the ocean hovering near or just beyond Catalina Island and it was darting around for several moments turning and then finally moved away. On 2001 passengers on a sailboat just east of Catalina Island were watching the stars and observing the night sky when they saw a very bright object uh, with a row of pulsing uh, pink or lavender lights beneath it. And it came up from the south, stopped, and as they watched, another object came and started zooming around it, and both then took off and disappeared off towards the northwest. Um, in 2002, more than 40 people at Toyon Bay on Catalina Island observed a for triangular formation of lights it was several times larger than the full moon, and it was just cruising out slowly towards Avalon Bay and out to the sea. And uh, it was close enough where they could actually hear a low humming noise. Uh, another case in 2003, a married couple was sitting on the bow of their boat right off Catalina Island watching the stars when they saw a huge triangular-shaped object with red flashing lights uh, move across the, the sky, go up into the cloud layer, and uh, disappeared. They heard no sound from it, but they believe it was many times larger than a commercial jet, so a pretty big object. And uh, you know, I could go on about these types of sightings, but for me the most interesting and uh, what I want to talk about here are the underwater sightings. And so I started to catalog all these underwater sightings I was receiving, and they came into this general area that you see on the map. Um, stretching pretty much from the Channel Islands, Santa Barbara, though some farther north than that, all the way down to Palos Verdes, San Pedro, Seal Beach, um, and a few cases all the way down to San Diego. But it, this particular area in the Santa Catalina Channel is where most of this activity seems to be centered. So I'm thinking, why? You know, this is odd. Why are there so many reports? Uh, let me see. Probably the earliest uh, reports I could find date right back to the modern age of UFOs in 1947. And it's really interesting because there was this uh, bizarre thing happening up in San Francisco Bay where a bunch of ships, commercial ship or ships and fishing ships and all kinds of boats were reporting this undersea reef or this mass that kept moving. And uh, this is, of course, very dangerous for shipping. And uh, it uh, alerted the Navy, who decided to send up a survey ship to investigate this disappearing reef, or this moving mass that so many people were reporting. And uh, they found it. it. It was a very large mass underwater, and they actually tracked it as it moved down the Southern California coast uh, and uh, saw this tracked it all the way down to the Los Angeles area off the coast here, where it moved out to sea about 150 miles uh, out to sea, tracked it, it was several hundred, 
100 feet underwater. It was very, very large. And at this point, they lost track of it um, and were never able to find it again. But this is one of the earliest reports I could find of uh, objects uh, moving underwater in this area. Here's a report from Catalina Island, also in uh, 1947, in which a UFO was photographed over a ship. And uh, one of the earliest UFO photographs actually out there. Here's another report of a uh, UFO is seen over Catalina Island again. I don't know why it's always Catalina Island, but uh, this is where this activity seems to be largely centered. And they photographed this object as it moved slowly over the island. Um, one early report occurred in 1951, as reported by Harold T. Wilkins, one of the pioneering UFO researchers, when he s said he talked to several witnesses who watched an unidentified object high up in the sky, come straight down and dive into the water. That was on November 21st, 1951. Uh, this next case occurred on August 8th, 1954, and I think it's probably my favorite case of all the cases I've uh, uncovered in this area. And on August 8th, 1954, uh, the Japanese steamship Aliki was off the coast of Long Beach when they saw a fireball. And it, they assumed it was a fireball, but it dived into the water, and then it came out again. Obviously not a fireball. Went back in, came out, uh, which is something, obviously, a fireball cannot do. And uh, one of many reports like that, where these objects are coming in and out of the water um, over and over again. On uh, February 9th, 1956, there was a really amazing case involving multiple witnesses on Redondo Beach. And what happened was on that evening, a group of people on the beach watched a object about 20 feet in diameter, perfectly round, glowing orange, glide slowly out of the sky and just plop there on the water just a few hundred yards offshore, not far. And it started, as it stayed there, a crowd started to gather and watch this thing. A group of 20, 30 people quickly gathered, and this included not only people who were on the beach just walking along, you know, ordinary citizens, but a group of lifeguards as well. There was a night watchman and police officers from uh, Redondo Beach and neighboring Hermosa Beach were all watching these things. Um, one of them actually rode out on a little rowboat and went right over this thing, and uh, he was able to describe it as being about 20 feet in diameter and just under the water there. It sunk under the water and started frothing. And uh, the Navy came the next day with Geiger counters looking for radiation and did not find anything. This whole case created a huge press uproar and uh, people were asking for answers. And the Coast Guard released an explanation saying that this object that everyone had thought was a UFO was not a UFO, it was actually a light buoy. And right here is the photo of this light buoy, which I don't know how it did it, but somehow flew up in the sky, <laughs> came down, and it doesn't look 20 feet in diameter to me, but uh, this is what the Coast Guard said it was. And a, a ludicrous ex explanation, obviously. And what's really interesting is uh, it wasn't long after this, maybe a month or two afterwards, when there was a repeat performance. This object came back again, and it was the same exact thing, really, only this time there was almost no press coverage at all. Now here's a very interesting case, and one of the few cases involving occupants. And uh, this occurred on July 28, 1962, when the captain of a chartered fishing boat observed what he initially thought was a submarine, except it had a very odd aft structure. And as he looked, he could see these uh, figures on the uh, deck there. Um, several were dressed in white pants and black shirts. One had a sky blue full body jumpsuit, but otherwise looked like normal people. Um, but what was really strange is as soon as this uh, submarine saw this fishing boat, all the figures quickly went below deck. This object turned and headed directly towards the fishing boat as if to ram it. 
The fishing boat made an emergency turn as this object came right under the boat and uh, it was totally silent. It made only a little swell in the water and moved very quickly. He was obviously very alarmed and contacted the military, who was very interested in the sighting, and showed him silhouettes of various submarines, including you know, German, Russian, Japanese, and so on, US submarines, trying to identify this submarine that he saw. And the odd part was none of the silhouettes matched what he saw really at all. Um, Jim and Coral Lorenzen heard about this case, and they are convinced it was a UFO simply because of the strange shape of the object and the fact that it made no sound. But I would add to that the strange behavior of the object or the submarine in which the men, as soon as the boat is visible, all dive below deck and this object nearly rams this small fishing boat, which is obviously not normal submarine behavior. So I don't know. It's, it's an interesting case and uh, sort of an outlier. There's not a lot like it, but uh, so many other bizarre cases. Uh, this is a photo of Avalon Bay and Catalina Island, again, where a lot of these cases are taking place. Um, let me tell you about a few other uh, cases. On February 5th, 1964, 11 passengers of the Hattie D had to be rescued by the Coast Guard after they saw, or after their boat was struck by something metallic, they said. They don't know what it was, they didn't see anything, but something struck their boat and sunk it. And uh, the crewman says, I don't, know, I don't care how deep of the water it was, but what hold us was steel and a long piece, and there was no give at all. So this could very well, they could very well have collided with a UFO, and certainly not the only case like that. There are a number of cases involving aircraft which have collided with UFOs, and for that matter, automobiles. So it's not that unusual, but it's one of the only cases I've found in which a boat actually collided with a UFO. On December 2nd, 1965, Miss Irwin Cohen and her son observed a glowing red object descend into the waters off San Pedro, setting up a big cloud of steam. And uh, they were able to snap a few photos, which didn't come out that well, and they assumed that this was some sort of uh, Navy missile or something. There is a naval base not far from where all this is going on, Point Magoo. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, I'm pretty certain that the people at the naval base must be aware of what's going on because it's right in their backyard. I don't think they're responsible for it, simply because of the way these UFOs are so brazen, hovering right over boats, right under boats, um, targeting various boats. So I don't know, it's hard to say, um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I did get contacted by one gentleman who says that he saw a UFO hovering in Avalon Harbor here and that he, there was photographs taken of it, but he did, was not able to locate the photograph, which I think what he's talking about is this photograph here, um, which is an, it, obviously a human-made boat, but it's interesting because it's perfectly saucer-shaped and looks exactly like a lot of what people are seeing in this area. And uh, I don't really have any other information about uh, this particular boat, but I thought it was interesting. And uh, I was really happy to find this photograph because I was getting a lot of inquiries about it. Um, in uh, October 1968, a sword fisherman by the name of George Heiner was fishing in his boat off the eastern end of Catalina Island when he saw a white domed shaped object rise up out of the water, maybe about 10 feet, and he was able to observe it through binoculars and could see that this was clearly nothing conventional. And it just kind of hovered, went back into the water, came out, went back in, and very bizarre behavior, but this is what these objects are doing. Uh, in 1969, a gentleman by the name of Paul Allion, he contacted me uh, after uh, hearing about my research from uh, Fate magazine, 
And uh, he said that when he was a child, he was playing with his walkie-talkies off the, co the coast here when uh, he intercepted messages coming from a, uh, apparently, a radio conversation coming from the boats down in the water there. And he heard, overheard an adult male saying, I don't know what the hell it is. It's just sort of floating 200 yards off my bow. And um, they went on describing this bizarre object that was floating there in the water. And uh, the next day, there was all these UFO sightings reported to the news. It was on TV. And uh, they described it as stars and you know, normal things like that, uh, balloons. And uh, he's convinced that uh, he actually intercepted the conversation of these Navy guys who were watching this object right off the coast here. Uh, in 1976, a witness was sitting along Sunset Beach when he observed a single white light moving along at about an altitude of 600 feet, very low. It suddenly assumed a 45 degree angle, diving downwards, and went straight into the water. I've got so many other cases. Uh, one really interesting case occurred in 1980s to a gentleman who prefers to remain anonymous. He's a senior electronics engineer, and he owns a fully equipped boat. And uh, he was uh, driving his boat, sailing between Santa Barbara Island and Santa Cruz, when he saw this fluorescent green colored light ahead of him. He assumed it was a boat and that they were on a collision course. It was kind of a foggy day. So he did the smart thing. He turned off his boat and turned on his lights and waited to see if this object was, in fact, coming towards him, which it was. And as it got closer and closer, it was coming directly towards him. And he realized it wasn't a boat at all. It was underwater. And it was this just bright, bright green light. And it came closer and closer and closer, as if targeting him, and came right under his boat. And when it came right under his boat, um, he says it looked to be at least 300 feet in diameter. And uh, you know his boat is 38 feet. And he started uh, taking readings with his depth sounder and determined that the object was about 100 feet below his boat. But at this point, his depth sounders quit functioning, as did his compasses, which started spinning. One spun so badly, it actually broke off its mountings. Um, his entire electrical system failed. And he became extremely frightened. He says it was actually one of the most frightening experiences of his life. And he was just waiting for this thing to leave, which it finally did. But it left him pretty tra traumatized. As he says, it was weird. I was just too petrified to move. So more cases. Here's a case uh, uncovered by Bill Hamilton in uh, 1989 off the coast of Marina del Rey. In fact, at the place where the marine land used to be located. And uh, he said in 1989 and again in 1990, uh, groups of witnesses watched objects moving above the water and um, also underneath the water, as if moving in tandem. This is something I've heard a few times, where there's objects below the water and objects right above them, and they're moving together back and forth. And uh, he saw, or these witnesses saw, um, one very large object which started emitting smaller objects. The large object was about 100 feet in diameter, perfectly round. And the others were much smaller, 10 to 12 feet. And uh, they would move underwater maybe about 500, 1,000 feet off the Abalone Cove here. And uh, every now and then, some of these underwater objects would come out of the water and then go back in and eventually moved away and uh, occurred several times. And uh, one time, a group of witnesses was there and said that they were chased away from this area by plainclothes gentlemen who claimed to be from some government agency and told them that they were trespassing and that this area was forbidden and they shouldn't be watching this stuff, and basically just chased them away from the area. Um, another case occurred in 1991 when a gentleman who lived on Malibu, looked out towards the ocean and saw what he thought was a boat on fire. He called the Coast Guard and they said, no, we have no reports of any boat on fire. You're probably watching some squid fishermen or something who use bright lights. 
but he's lived there for many, many years, seen all kinds of boats, and there was nothing like this. He said it was prismatic, it was absolutely beautiful, it was a very, very bright light, and eventually just snapped out. This is an illustration done by my sister-in-law, or yeah, Kisara, who went down to uh, the Zuma Beach area with her friend to look for dolphins, and instead saw this very, very bright object. And uh, a lot, th this particular area, Zuma Beach, Point Doom, this is where I got a lot of reports. Uh, I interviewed one lady who went to Zuma Beach with her family, and she didn't see anything, but had a period of missing time while swimming, and came out of the water and had, uh, no one knew where she was, and she had scars on her body afterwards. I had another case just like that at Topanga Beach, where someone was swimming, didn't see anything, but suddenly had a missing time, found herself in deep water, swam back to shore, and had triangular marks on her body. And uh, she refused to do a formal interview with me, so it's kind of a, you know, not a, a fully investigated case, but one of so many that uh, I've uncovered in this area. Uh, in May 5th, 1992, two friends were walking along Malibu Beach when they saw a fireball, what they thought was a fireball, descend from the sky and go into the ocean. And he said, it was maybe about a mile away, not very far away, but it hit, when it hit the ocean surface, it didn't make any splash at all. It just zip went right in, um, which is something I hear again and again. Normally when you know, a plane or something hits the water, it makes a huge splash. These objects have some method, some force field, which allows them to go into the water without making any, so much as a ripple. Another case I'd like to talk about uh, is when two men who were near the coast of Palos Verdes at night saw several glowing disks floating in the water. And uh, one of the witnesses was so impressed by the sighting, he returned later and saw them again. Only this time, he saw several black helicopters uh, which were hovering over the area. And he said he was approached by government agents who told him in no uncertain terms that this area is off limits and that he should not be watching this. Um, in 2002, a gentleman was camping along the coast of Point Magoo when he saw a light moving above the water, about 100 feet above the water, and below this object and beneath the surface of the water were two other objects which were also darting back and forth. Um, and again, not the first case I have like that. Um, there was one gentleman who said that he was in the Santa Barbara Channel Islands area um, in his boat in relatively shallow water when he saw what he thought at first were whales diving beneath his boat, because they were you know, pretty far down there and he couldn't, the water wasn't perfectly clear. But at one point, one of these objects came up closer to the surface and he saw that it was gray, it was metallic, and it was round. And he it was just darting underneath his boat. And he's counted dozens of these objects moving underneath his boat and has no idea what they were. They were totally silent and they weren't whales, They're, unless whales are perfectly round and metallic, which obviously... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so much is going on here. Um, on March 5th, 2005, a gentleman from Newport Beach was taking pictures of boats on the water when he saw what appeared to be two boats behaving strangely in a sort of weird rocking back and forth motion and uh, staying in place for a very long time. And uh, he took a photograph of them, and viewing the photographs, he saw that there were actually several tiny spheres of light also around these apparent boats. So he doesn't think they were boats, he thinks that they were obviously uh, UFOs. Um, in January 2006, a lady by the name of Elena, a resident of Santa Barbara and several others, watched five or six green fireballs of light uh, move out to sea and descend onto the surface of the ocean and then dive underneath the water. So these objects are clearly going in and out of the water here. I received a lot of emails from people who you know, saw me on TV or read one of my articles, and I'd like to talk a little about some of these email reports that I've gotten from people. Um, one gentleman, this is actually up towards a Washington area, 
said that he was looking at these jets flying in, coming to land in at a SeaTac airport, and uh, saw this 747 being followed by this white sphere of light. And as he's watching it, this uh, sphere of light zoomed in behind the jet, followed it, and then streaked down towards the ocean, stopped, and dived into the water off of uh, Redondo. Not the Redondo Beach here, but uh, another Redondo. And uh, he checked the newspapers the next day, thinking it was going to be front page news, which of course it wasn't. Um, I asked him, did you report this sighting? And no, he didn't. And this is the problem we have. Um, I'm going to say less than one in a hundred people report their sightings. Um, a lot of people don't know where to turn to. They'll call the police. The police will normally refer you to MUFON or the National UFO Reporting Center. Um, so I always encourage people to report their sightings uh, so we can get you know, a better uh, handle on what's going on. Another email I got was from a gentleman who was with his ex-wife um, on the bay at Fort Bragg, California on uh, July of 1981. And he says it was dusk when he and his wife watched a large green fluorescent orb, which they're estimating about 15 or 20 feet in diameter, came coming from the east over the land, hovering over the water, moved down slowly, landed on the water, and sunk inside. I thought, wow, you know, that's odd. How did, they didn't even know what to think of it. And uh, a couple of hours later, they were back outside watching, and, or actually just about 10 or 15 minutes later, and uh, they were about to go back into the hell when the hotel when they saw this object come back up out of the water, move straight up, and dart away over land. So I don't know what they were doing, darting down there and for just a few minutes, <laughs> exploring underwater, but this is the kind of stories we're stuck with. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Um, Lots of research has been done about UFOs and their proximity to nuclear power plants. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I know where San Onofre is, right along the coast there. I did get one case of a UFO over San Onofre. I'm not sure that there's a huge connection with all this activity there. But uh, I'm going to have to move pretty quickly because I'm getting close to my uh, uh, ending here. But I will entertain some questions if I get a chance. Um, another gentleman contacted me who said in 2012 he uh, saw he and several other people witnessed an object exiting the water um, and uh, he also said that uh, his father was an avid fisherman and on several occasions he saw UFOs coming in and out of the water in the Catalina Island area. Um, this is a photo by Young Shiren of an object which hovered over Santa Monica Bay, and you can see it's directly over this little boat here, which is one of these weird things these objects are doing. This is a photo taken by another gentleman who saw a UFO hovering over his house in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, this was a, a photo which was taken over Santa Monica, um, it's a one in a series of four photos, and you can see the Santa Monica Bay right off the coast. The, right off from the distance there. Um, this was a photo of the gentleman in the black shirt, his name is David, and the guy in the red shirt is Jonathan. David was at Venice Beach when he saw an object come swooping down over the water. It was glowing bright red, landed on the water, it turned bright white. He had a period of disorientation and missing time. He couldn't tell me how close it was, but it, it felt, I mean, he felt the object was uh, just a few hundred yards away, but he lost track of time, um, which is you know, a, a red flag that uh, UFO investigators, of course, look for. And eventually this object darted away, turned blue, and was gone. Um, the gentleman here on the right, he was on Catalina Island in 1980 with a group of 11 people. They went there every year to camp out, but on this particular year they had an extraordinary experience in which they saw a group of lights between them and the mainland, 
And uh, these lights started emitting other lights, which started darting around, which swooped in, came over their campground, and uh, started going around them, sending down beams of light. They had several cameras, flashlights, and all, uh, things like this. Every single electronic thing they had failed. All their radios, all their flashlights, all their cameras. This is a group of 11 people. They became very alarmed. Some a few of them became so scared they panicked and ran from the campground down the trail. One person ran off to the edge and started vomiting in fear. And uh, they were extremely traumatized. Interestingly enough, two of these people became uh, very famous. One's a famous uh, actor in a science fiction franchise movie, and the other is a famous sitcom actor um, wh whose names you definitely recognize. Unfortunately, they have declined to be interviewed and don't want to talk about it. I was able to interview only three of the 11 witnesses to this particular incident. And uh, from what I learned, I do believe that they had a mass abduction. Um, this is a photograph I took. And if you look carefully, you can see a little strange light right there, and, uh, which I didn't see at the time. This is during the filming of Deep Sea UFOs with the History Channel. But I held up the camera, I'm like, all right, if you're out there, show yourselves. And I clicked, and uh, I didn't see anything, but uh, that little speck of bright light, and here's a, a blow up of it. I don't know what it is, but I've got a couple of photos like that. Now let me get to my, the conclusion of my talk and why I think that there's a base. And uh, I want to go back to this wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon in 1992. Um, I interviewed a lot of people. One, uh, group of people I interviewed were driving south through the canyon. They saw a large mothership, and it was surrounded by 20 or 30 objects which were moving in and out of this craft. And uh, they watched it for 20 minutes, a half an hour, before they became tired, and the people, his passengers, wanted to leave. He wanted to stay and continue watching it, but they insisted on leaving. I think that probably they were a little frightened, and they left. But I found one couple who live on Saddle Peak, which is perhaps the highest point in this area. It overlooks not only Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley, but the whole coastal area. And uh, they were drawn outside their home around 8 p.m. that evening by a group of objects coming up from below. Normally when someone sees a UFO, it's a, you know, a coming from above. They saw these objects coming up from behind a ridge towards the ocean, um, not one or two objects, but 10. And I thought, wow, you know, that's bizarre wonder if there's some sort of Air Force activity going on. And they went back inside to continue watching their movie, when about 10 minutes later, there was more flashes of light. They ran outside and watched a group of 10 or 20 objects again come up from behind the ridge. And when it happened a third time, the wife said, you know what, I'm going to start counting these. And uh, she had counted about you know, 20 or 30 up to this point. This went on all evening, 10 or 20 or 30 times. By the time it was done, it was 11, 12 p.m. They were both thoroughly traumatized. They called the police the next day. She counted, she says, 200 objects. The husband said, no, 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 it's, it was only 100. You know, I had to laugh out loud, because that's still way too many, right? And uh, they were very alarmed. They, they had no idea what these things were. They were sure at this point that it wasn't military, because a few, point, a few of these objects came and hovered right over them, and they could see that they weren't perfectly circular. They were, in fact, more elliptical and had a weird kind of a sine wave or a mathematical symbol on the bottom. And so they saw this whole event happen. And uh, years later, I was contacted by another gentleman who was in a different location on the other side of this ridge, which they were looking at. And he said he saw these objects coming up from the ocean area. Very, they, there would be this bright flash of light, and 10 or 20 objects would come out of this light. And uh, right down there towards the ocean. So I'm thinking, all right, now I'm getting closer to what's going on. I later located another witness who said he was down at Venice Beach on that evening when he suddenly heard what he thought was a waterfall, turning around, looks at the ocean, sees this giant stadium-sized craft rising up out of the water. He says there was 20 or 30 other people there. And water was just pouring off the sides of this thing like a waterfall, creating this huge sound. And not only was there this one large object, there was dozens of much smaller objects, which he's described as spherical or saucer-shaped, darting around. And this thing moved up and moved off to the north, going up the coast there. 
So this is another case I have involving not one or two objects, or 10 or 20, but more. So I'm thinking, what is going on here? Uh, then uh, here's another case involving multiple objects. This was one year later during the midst of this whole UFO wave when Judy, is her name, from Malibu, started seeing these clusters of objects coming in from the Catalina Island area. And uh, not just one or two, but dozens of these things. And she snapped a number of photographs, and this is probably the best one. Unfortunately, this is in black and white. If you could see the color one, you'd see that each of these objects has, is surrounded by a glowing red aura of some kind. And I think this is exactly what all these other people are seeing. Um, I've talked to so many people who are seeing stuff in this area. God, I'm forgetting some really good reports. There was a gentleman who was in the Navy. He was posted on the far side of Catalina Island when suddenly the entire ship went on lockdown because there was these very bright pulsating objects right uh, off on the horizon line there. He ran up to the ship and says, what's going on? And they said, get away from us. We're trying to figure out what's going on here. And they were not appearing on radar, but the whole ship saw it and uh, really upset the entire crew. Another gentleman contacted me who is a submarine navigator and t told me that there is a very, very deep trench uh, that runs all the way up to the uh, Mendocino area, the Monterey Trench, which is actually one of the deepest areas, coastal areas, uh, in, in the oceans anywhere. You know, not including, of course, the Mariana Trench, but right off the coast there. It's extremely deep. And uh, so that it would be the perfect place for these types of craft to hide. I talked to another gentleman who was in a convoy of boats, two boats, um, that they were ferrying up the coast for uh, their client. They were taking these boats up north. When they had a group of lights surround their boat, um, his electrical system failed, and suddenly the depth sounder said that they were in 10 feet of water, which he knew that they weren't. Um, so apparently this object was actually under their boat. And uh, it was a very alarming and scary experience for him, and he never talked about it to anyone, and not even the other convoy boat, who he lost track of. So a lot of cases. Um, I recently interviewed a Boy Scout who was on Parsons Beach. Um, this was on July 26, 2014, with a group of 50 or more Boy Scouts and their leaders um, were all there, and he was in his tent. Everyone had just gone to bed around 9 p.m. when he and his two friends saw a very bright object hovering over the water there, and this object expanded and started to e emit smaller objects. And uh, they counted them too, and by the time it was done, they counted between 50 and 100 objects, which they described as being saucer-shaped, spherical-shaped, rectangular-shaped, triangular-shaped, V-shaped, and pretty much all the shapes you can um, imagine. I did a, a film interview with him. It's posted on Facebook, and if you just type in Catalina Island, you can see that interview in its entirety. But again, it was one of many, many cases involving multiple objects. So I'm thinking, what is going on here? If there is not a base, there's got to be at least a parking lot down there of these UFOs. Um, but then, you know, I started to do investigating these abduction cases. And most times when someone's taken on a UFO or abducted by a UFO, they're taken, you know, into a rounded room, they're examined on a table. It's pretty predictable to a large extent. I've got a number of cases in which people weren't, were abducted, you know, in this area along the coast or on Catalina Island, in which they weren't taken inside a UFO, apparently. They were taken to some sort of underground area. One gentleman I spoke with, who is now a medical doctor and a pilot, um, he was a teenager at the time with his friend on a boat in Catalina Island, uh, right there in the bay, when they had missing time. Um, a few weeks later, he returned to his home in uh, the San Fernando Valley and had another experience in which he saw a shadow of a gray moving along the wall as he's running through his home trying to figure out what, what these weird sounds were that he was hearing. He was alone in his home. And these two incidents, he filed away and didn't think much about it until later and uh, went under hypnosis with Yvonne Smith and under hypnosis recalled uh, the missing time incident on Catalina Island 
in which he and his friend were taken not inside a UFO, but to an underground area with rock walls. Um, it says it was a pretty large chamber there. He wasn't scared. Uh, he wasn't the target, apparently, of this abduction because he was just sat there on a bench while his friend was taken to another room and apparently examined. But uh, he said he didn't see gray type ETs. He saw more the praying mantis or bug-like type um, ETs. Um, this is an artist representation of what he saw. And uh, just one, one case which like, all right, this is kind of interesting. And then there was another case uh, involving Kim Carlsberg, who had seen a UFO earlier over Malibu and started having abduction experiences following that sighting. On one of her abductions, she was not taken inside a UFO. She was taken into an underground area. She said it was a vast auditorium-like area. And uh, she saw not only greys and other types of ETs, but lots of humans as well. And uh, there was another uh, two people in the Santa Barbara area, two ladies who were driving along the coast when they had a missing time experience. And under hypnosis, they also recalled being taken to an underground base area. So maybe these people were being taken to this alleged undersea base. I don't know. It's hard to say. But as, as I said earlier, n normally when I interview someone who's had missing time or been taken on board, they're taken inside a UFO. And I've got a number of cases where that's just not what's happening in this particular area. Um, the sightings are still ongoing. Um, up at Point Magoo, there's a number of regular sightings going on. I know that there's two ladies in Palos Verdes who are having UFO watching parties because they watch this little object come out of the water at the same time every evening and uh, bring their friends over and they all watch it. And at some point it stopped. And there's another person I interviewed who said that she was on a boat uh, going to Catalina and this object, these glowing objects appeared underneath the water and were circling around the boat. Uh, saw another, or another uh, case involved people who were on the flying fish tour on Catalina Island when they saw an object underneath the water, a lighted object. Um, a lot of cases. One lady, she emailed me. She told me that she had this dream where, while she was parked off the coast there of Catalina Island um, in which this ET came onto her boat and uh, she had intimate relations with it and uh, woke up and the next um, morning this uh, one of the passengers on the boat said, you'll never guess what I saw last night. I was out on the deck of the boat when this UFO came and was hovering right over our boat. And she's like, oh, <laughs> that, that really alarmed her and she wondered if her dream was connected to that. And, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I tend to think that maybe it was. Now here's a recent development. This is a photo which was shown to me by Jimmy Church of Dark Matter Radio. He called me up and he says, you're investigating uh, the possibility of an undersea base off the coast here. And I'm like, yeah. He says, well, take a look at this. What do you think of this? And you know, I don't know what to think of this. Uh, this is a Google image apparently showing a very large uh, structure, an anomalous structure of some kind right off the coast of Malibu right in the exact area where all of this stuff is going down. And uh, I'm not a map expert or anything, and I really can't speak to the authenticity of it. But I have to say, it looks strange. And uh, I, I don't know. It's a very large mass. This was originally uh, pointed out by Robert Stanley years ago. Robert Stanley, uh, Bill Hamilton, Andruffel, these are the pioneers of the research in this area, and all of them have talked, uncovered cases of these underwater UFOs. Robert Stanley said it got so busy during the 70s and 80s that whole families would go down there to watch these UFOs um, coming in and out of the water. Here's another Google image, um, which is farther uh, south towards uh, Palos Verdes area, and uh, again shows what's apparently a hole in the water. Um, Hard to say what this is, but uh, again, it's another bizarre image that I, I really don't know what to make of. Um, could this be a, a tunnel? I had a number of people approach me and say, you know about the tunnels, right? And I'm like, what tunnels? They said, there are tunnels 
built by the military, which stretched from Area 51 to Edwards Air Force Base to San Clemente Island. I had three or four different people tell me that, so I was not able to get confirmation of it. But here was a very interesting incident which occurred just a few years ago in which apparently a missile came up out of the Santa Monica Bay here and flew off into the sky and no official agency could account for it. Of course, the Navy was contacted, the Coast Guard, Point Magoon Naval Base, and no one had any explanations for it. Later, the explanation was that it was an unusual airplane contrail. Now, that doesn't look like an airplane contrail to me. Um, I talked to someone who said that she actually witnessed this thing as it occurred, and she is absolutely convinced that it was a missile of some sort. I don't know. It's really hard to say, but it's one of several bizarre things that are going on in this exact area. It turns out the Navy was doing sonar experiments in this area. They were sued by several environmental groups um, saying that you can't do naval sonar experiments in this area because it damages marine life. The Navy won that suit, uh, then they uh, appealed, and just a few months ago, the Navy was told that they can no longer do sonar experiments in this area. So I don't know if they're aware of what's going on or not. I tend to think that they are. I talked to someone who said that he has a friend who works at Point Magoo Naval Base, and that yes, they are absolutely aware of this activity. I talked to someone else who told me that his friend, this is hearsay, but it's still interesting, um, that these two guys were scuba diving off the coast here and uh, were taking cameras and doing all sorts of film footage not far from Point Magoo when they were approached by Navy personnel who stole their cameras, took their footage, and said, no, you're not allowed to film in this area. And I've got a number of secondhand reports that the Navy is aware of what's going on um, certainly there's been an enormous amount of black helicopter activity in this area, and uh, I would be shocked if the Navy wasn't aware of what's going on in this area. Most recently, I was contacted by a lady who's a photographic nut. She just loves taking photos. That's all she does. She goes onto the beach and takes these photos because she's seeing these strange lights, and a number of bizarre objects are appearing on her... Uh, Film. And this is one of the better photographs she's taken. This is out over the water. Here's another she took, um, a series actually, of a couple of photos over uh, Zuma Beach. She didn't see anything. There was a lot of people. It was a crowded beach. And yet this photo, apparently these photos, which were taken right after another, apparently show this large cigar-shaped object coming up out of the water. So I, I think these objects do have the ability to cloak themselves and there's probably a lot more activity going on than we're seeing with our naked eyes. But uh, that's basically my lecture. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I think that uh, the activity is not going to stop. I don't think the UFOs are going to go away, and sooner or later the truth is going to come out. And if there's not a base down there, uh, there's definitely hundreds and hundreds of these UFOs I'm darting back and forth and doing all kinds of things. And uh, yeah, that's basically my lecture. I want to thank you all for coming and uh, appreciate you listening. more outspoken in terms of the really true UFO cases. So MUFON is moving forward with this approach and will be publishing papers in these different areas to allow the general public and even the scientific community
to be able to be challenged by what we're finding. That's the strength of MUFON as an organization, is being really the truth seekers of the UFO field. Good morning, everybody. Our next speaker, Preston Dennett, began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic, unexplained encounters. Since then, he's interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He's a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, a ghost hunter, paranormal researcher, author of 16 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, including Fate Magazine, Atlantis Rising, the MUFON UFO Journal, Nexus, Paranormal Magazine, UFO Magazine, Mysteries Magazine, and Ufologist, just to name a few. Here to talk about if there is an undersea UFO base off the coast of California, let me welcome Preston Dennett. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming here. I want to thank MUFON and Jen Harzan and all the volunteers who make this event happen. I'm really excited about uh, speaking to you today, and I've got a lot of information I want to share. Now, is there an underwater UFO base off the coast of California? I think I've got an, enough evidence to say that there is definitely something going on. Um, and uh, after I'm through with my lecture, you can decide whether or not you know, I've persuaded you. But uh, I'm astounded at what I found uh, after you know, focusing on this particular area. As you all know, um, only a few of these, his fellow soldiers or Navy men actually remembered seeing these lights. It's a very interesting case. And, uh, one of many that I, that I have of people who've you know, been on Navy ships and had encounters. Uh, one gentleman who contacted me, his name is uh, Kim Kamen, and he was on a Navy ship in which he was actually taken, abducted from the Navy ship into a UFO. It's a very long, complex encounter. He was fully conscious during the entire thing. He remembered it without hypnosis. He saw these praying mantis type ETs, which were, he said, 10 to 15 feet tall. And uh, it's an extraordinary case, and it's much too lengthy to go into detail here. But uh, my point is that, uh, again, a lot of people are seeing this stuff all across the world. Uh, one gentleman contacted me. He was in a boat about 50 miles off Daytona, Florida. And had, he actually, he's an avid sailor. He'd sailed across the world many times. He's seen submarines surface right near his boat and he was out there um, off the coast of Florida when he saw these green bright lights underwater and he became alarmed so he stopped his boat and these lights this light came right under his boat and stopped and he's estimating it was about 50 100 feet down um, bigger than his boat which is you know a pretty small boat but at least a couple of hundred feet across and just stayed there uh, he had no real fear his Electronics are, were not affected or anything like that. And eventually this thing just moved al along. But it was very interesting because he felt like he was targeted. All right, now I first um, began investigating a wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon uh, in 1992. There was a wave of sightings over Topanga Canyon. And uh, this is what kind of led me down this pathway to finding out that there's an undersea base off the California coast. In this case, two boys saw these spiraling star-like objects uh, overhead, which moved back and forth and then disappeared off into the distance. Here's another case in Topanga Canyon in which four uh, young men saw first one object come over the house, followed by two others, followed by this very large object, 
which sent down a beam of light over the house and uh, really frightened one of the witnesses so badly he told me, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you any details. I was just too scared. I couldn't look at it. No, I'm sure uh, most of our planet is covered with water. And it's surprising that uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of attention paid to USOs. By that I mean unidentified submersible objects, which are in effect the same thing as UFOs, only that these objects are going in and out of the water, uh, moving at high speeds underwater, uh, much higher speeds than anything that we officially have. And uh, so I think it's no surprise, really, that uh, these objects are uh, using our oceans, our rivers, our lakes uh, to hide or to do whatever it is they're doing. Now, I want to talk about a few cases outside of uh, California, because certainly I've gotten a lot of information all over the world from people who've seen this stuff. Uh, this is a case which took place in New York, a landscape photographer was uh, working there along the East River when he saw the water starting to froth and boil, and he snapped a series of four pictures. This is probably the best one. This is from Wendell Stevens' uh, UFO photo archives. And uh, he, yeah, he snapped this picture and watched this object, along with several other witnesses, come right up out of the river. Uh, as for those of you who heard Linda Zimmerman's talk, a lot of uh, UFO activity in upstate New York where these objects are coming out of small bodies of water, reservoirs, uh, lakes, and things like this. Um, here's a book from Wendell Stevens, uh, UFO Contact from Undersea, which presents a case in which a man and his wife were actually taken to an undersea base off the coast of Florida. And here in this photo, uh, these gentlemen did not see the UFO coming out of the water, but uh, the photo clearly shows something. Um, and not only that, it shows you can see the water is uh, disturbed underneath this apparent object. Here's another uh, series of photos. These are two different cases, actually, but they are both in the same general area near Tenerife and the Canary Islands. Um, one took place in 1979 and the other in 1974. And it's remarkable because these photos are extremely similar. Uh, Betty Andreessen is an abductee from uh, Massachusetts, and she also reports being taken into an underground or undersea type base uh, by her uh, ETs and uh, shown all kinds of things. Her case is, of course, extremely complex. But my point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of these. My name is Jan Harzant. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings. MUFON is really more just left of center, where we try to take a scientific approach by collecting the data first off, and then reviewing the data, investigating the data, and making sure that what we're seeing is actually something that's truly an unknown. We have 3,000 members worldwide, many scientists, physicists, PhDs, metallurgists, biologists, all the way down to just the average citizen who really wants to get involved. 
Some of those have chosen to become field investigators and they go through our field investigative training courses. They become part of the team in their state or country where they reside and they actually get engaged in going out and meeting this phenomena head on. We receive about 500 to 1,000 reports per month from around the world. Field investigators will take the case, generally review it, uh, try to come up with a hypothesis, checking star charts, and we'll go put an investigation in place to determine what exactly happened. We've recently formed a science review board, and that board is made up of scientists from around the United States and around the world to review some of our more significant cases and try to render an opinion on them. What we'd like to do is be more outbound. These undersea UFO cases. Uh, this is a case here which took place in the South Pacific. Uh, there was a huge storm that caused one of the largest sea rescues up to that time. Um, I wrote an article all about this uh, UFO rescue at sea because uh, there was this boat called the Ramtha which was sinking and the rescuers could not find them. And right when this boat was about to sink, this very large glowing object appeared right above the boat and kind of targeted it. This allowed the rescuers to come right up to the boat and pull the passengers off. The object disappeared. And no sooner had they pulled these people off than this boat sank. So I thought that was kind of an interesting interactive case. Uh, this was a photo sent to me from a gentleman who was taking photographs of a sunset over New Jersey. And I don't know if you can see it, but if you look carefully, there is a uh, disc right here. And it's a little hard to see. But I'm not sure if this is a trick of the photo aperture. And what's odd is it didn't appear on any of the photos taken before or after. And if you look really closely, it's almost a perfect circle. So I don't know, I thought it was a pretty interesting photograph and certainly really beautiful, but a little hard to see. Now I started to receive, as I said earlier, a lot of cases of these objects over the water. And uh, I didn't think much of it at first, I just cataloged them. This was a case which took place in Mission Bay to two gentlemen who saw this very small object, maybe the size of a baseball or a basketball, glowing sphere darting back and forth um, out to sea, back into Mission Bay and all over the place, but just right above the water there. Um, got a number of cases um, involving people who were on Navy ships. Uh, one gentleman told me that he was out in the uh, Atlantic and uh, he was on his ship when everyone was drawn onto the deck to watch these very, really large bright orange lights which were pulsing. And uh, he actually went up to the bridge and asked about them and they said, you're not seeing this, don't talk about it. And uh, he and Several other soldiers actually all watched this. The next day, he went up and uh, was telling his buddies who had watched this with him, and uh, none of them remembered it. They had missing time with this sighting.